this at the time. So um, it's almost as good as having two guests here. So, yeah, this really good. Um, so first of all, let me just welcome uh, William Gallagher, who is going to... <laughs> and, and now, if you could please put your hands together properly for our, 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 our director, real, real live, proper guest, Jim Bailey. Hello, everybody. Um, we were looking at running order before, and there's so much top of the pops, Greg's up, and Pan's people room. Actually, Julian, you knew Pan. <laughs> I knew Pan, yeah. So he convinced the Pan with the choreographer for Pan's people that's his joke. <laughs> it's quite good. It's huh. quite good. You laughed before. Yeah, no, I did. But that was around the time you were, uh, you were working with them around, you just knew them socially? I knew them socially. I was working in the BBC um, on Thursday's Child at the time. And um, one of the guys, the sound recorders, shared a house with one of Pan's people, Ruth. And so I kind of got to know her and then Babs. And, you know, he used to go to the club and drink with Pan's people, which is kind of quite cool. Um, and I learned a few of the moves. Yeah. Were you old enough to be drinking? No. <laughs> okay, so here we go. But at that time, you were well known for certain music and dance yourself, weren't you? Mark, could we please have a clip of something that people may not remember at all? Mm -hmm. was saying oh, he knows you from school so I know you from working on a break seven stuff but it's always double deck because of all the things you've done that's yeah double, you, last year? I th double deckers was an extraordinary I mean did do lots of people remember double deck oh, yeah. yeah and it was one of those extraordinary shows that I think they thought the TV companies thought um, really fell between two stools. It was neither wholly British, it was neither wholly American, and we had HR Puff and stuff around that time. But and they kind of were worried about the fact that it fell between two stools. So it sort of crept out at the BBC. Not very. They bought it, but they didn't do a big fanfare about it. Um, but it became phenomenally successful, and it was shown again and again. I think always through the school holidays. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I remember when I was in, I was about, I was a young married woman of 21 and some kids started coming and looking through the window and I thought, what's the matter with them? And it was because Double Deckers was running and I didn't know because we didn't get any repeat fees or anything. 
So therefore I hadn't realised that it was being aired again. But then it was eventually, in, um, I managed to get some tapes of it because a friend of mine who was in the Midlands, living in Birmingham, said, oh, it's been shown locally on a cable and I'll start recording it for you. So I was able to kind of see it again and begin to... So anyway, it's actually not, it didn't last for very long, I'm surprised. 17 episodes. Just 17? Yeah. That seemed unusual, because what I didn't realise at the time was that it was this American-British co-production. I had in my head it was ITV, but it was uh, yeah, David no, in the States, Universal, I presume, and, IT, and BBC. Yeah, the, the Harry Booth and Roy Simpson, who were Century Films, who produced, we made it in Elstree, and they were making, I think they had done um, six and a half, <coughs> which was a British Film Foundation, uh, which was a very similar kind of thing to Double Deckers. But they sort of brought it all together with Double Deckers and they had Melvin Hayes, who was a running character in it, as Bert, the road sweeper. So when we needed an adult, we had one. But fundamentally, they were branding something that they thought was going to go very big. And the idea was we were going to do a, another series really quite quickly after. So the first 17 were meant to go out there and then we'd do another 17. What they hadn't realised in picking such a, shall I say, diverse group of young people was that we would all grow at very different stages. Mm -hmm. So when we did meet up a year later, we all looked really weird because everybody had sort of changed in a kind of odd way. Debbie had suddenly got very tall and Michael's voice had broken, and Peter was suddenly doing Zeffirelli movies and being kind of rather cool, and it was extraordinary. What about Tiger? There's Tiger. Was the Tiger. Off in Hollywood, by the way. Well, the Tiger, by then, was definitely off. It would be a contract with Disney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, when was it decided not to carry on, then? Well, I think it was at that point. It was, it was really quite quick that we knew it wasn't going to be picked up to a second series. Um, but I think there was a lot of stuff going on, like, um, I mean, I was 15 when I finished it, so I'm not, a lot of what I'm remembering, I'm remembering what I've been told. Um, but I think Melvin told me quite a lot, because he, I think he had a financial, oh, thank you very much, yeah, that's funny. He had a, a, some financial stake in it as scriptwriter as well. But I was told that the guy who was doing all the finances, burnt some of the paperwork and left. So that was interesting. And also there were a lot of legal problems between David Gerber in the States and Roy and um, Harry in the UK, which was to do with the repeat fees, the buy. I actually never signed a contract for Double Deckers, ever, because my father at the time, Bush Bailey, was head of artist contracts at the BBC. And he looked at the contract, he said, you're not signing that. So I never actually signed it. He said it was okay to do the work, but... No, he didn't want me to do the work. I, 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 it was a terrible, terrible day. He didn't want me to do double deckers because I was at that stage of O levels. And he thought I really ought to get some O levels. So I did the full dramatic number. I cried, I wept, I pleaded, I swore. I did everything and said, I promise I'll go to Krampus and get all my O levels after double deckers. So double deckers, that was... Not just another job for you, you really, you really wanted it. I really wanted that job. I worked incredibly hard. The auditions were three days, and there were loads of people. Fiona Fullerton was up for it. She's the one I remember most. Um, but there were loads and loads of kids up for this, this show. It was, I mean, now it would be, I think, we'd expect it because we're so used to seeing lines of children or waiting to go for Annie or something. But you, that didn't happen at that period. You went to a stage school, um, it had to be a good stage school, and then you would go on and do some work. But this kind of, everybody was there. And we had three days, and then we were filmed, and then that was taken to the States. And I remember going into the loos to practice something that I thought might be a kind of killer move, and to do it so nobody could see it, and then do it just in the moment in front of the camera. So it was pretty sad. 15. Well, 14 hours then. We all want to see the move, though. <laughs> well, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> uh, so, do you think it was an American influence that changed the audition? Yeah, I think it was. I mean, I think we were running... The Americans wanted a very particular look 
for what they thought of as Britain. And it's quite interesting, watching the double-decker bus with the BP in the background of Buckingham Palace reminded me of that episode of Friends when they come over to England for the wedding and you've got, you know, Virgin Airlines and Richard Branson being a nice cockney newspaper seller, that sort of stuff. And I thought, yes, it's selling something to America that is packaged and perceived as being kids in Britain. So how did it do in the States? Well, it did very well. I mean, we were told it hadn't. We were told it had bombed and that the Americans didn't like it and we weren't going to get another series. But actually, it ran very, very well. And it so happened that I had a godmother in California. Her husband was an actor, Austin Willis. Um, and so they were saying, no, you know, it's doing well, the word is good, it's on every week. They're just repeating it, rolling it, rolling it, rolling it. And obviously, from the Double Decker's website, one of the guys there who started up a fan-based website, he gets loads of people from America. So, it, it went down well. I shouldn't be surprised if there's a website for it, but there's a website for the Double Decker. Oh yeah, there's a website, there's a Facebook page, and because I've, I started to think, to begin with, I thought, okay, I, I'm just leaving that behind and moving on to other things. But then I thought, this is silly, because if I go to say what I'm doing, other people will make it up. So I decided to get in touch, and in fact, used the website to ask some of the fans for particular things they were interested in, because i have just written uh, a chapter in a book on um, child performers, and I wanted to know what the audience thought I was doing in Double Deckers, and comparing that with what I thought I was doing. Actually, I want to ask you about that part of your career later. So we'll come back to that. I'm wondering, um, then, if you wanted this job so much and then it only ran for the 17, was it a big crashing disappointment or were you just on to the next thing? No, I was just on to the next thing. Which I, I think, I can't quite remember the order of things, whether it was Witch's Daughter after that, I think it might have been. No, sure. um, but yeah, it just, it just rolled on. It was six months, incredibly intense work. And because I did most of the singing and the dancing, the boys, I don't know, what is it with boys in 1970? They didn't want to dance. Um, and uh, actually, Bryn Ford was, was great. He got a guitar, because of course he founded Aswad. Yeah. And he got a guitar with his first paycheck. So he would all be in a corner doing stuff like that with a guitar. I don't know what Peter did, but he sort of learnt the lines and came on and did it. He wasn't that interested. No. I think he knew he was going to be a movie star. Actually, I saw him a little while ago, and we had some good laughs about Double Deckers. Um, you're saying about the auditions book, and you told me before that uh, there was um, some kind of move by the studio to make it seem like you were actually real kids that you just could do, but you weren't. Oh, yeah. Professionals, yeah. It? When they did the launch, all the press coverage was all about, and this I actually did look at again because I was writing this chapter, and it was all about amazing, these seven children have been picked up and they're going to be huge stars and enormously successful and very, very rich, and they've just been picked up off the street because they're sort of incredible. And it was just so not true. I mean, we had all come from some kind of either theatre school. Well, Peter had already done um, a, a, the Flaxton Boys, so he'd done that before he came up for Yorkshire. Um, Bryn had done Six and a Half, Michael Drayson Brains had done Six and a Half. The new ones were Tiger and Donut, oh, and the American boy, Bruce Sticks. But they had all been at drama club or dramas, but the equivalent of kind of Anna show now. So actually, by that time, you were already really well known. So I've just checked my show about the day wrong, Double Decker's aired in 71. Mm -hmm. All right. But we have a thing you started in 67. 67, yeah. So, okay. Mark, can we have the second clip, please? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. It's laying on the table. Right. That's the best thing. Mm -hmm. Susan, boil a cup of water as quick as you can. Sorry. Oh, you're the ship last night. 
Wasn't the whole village out in the water, born in the main with ropes? That's right, when I broke my wrist, putting the last man off the ship. Uh, at least I thought he was a He wasn't. One man was left lying on the deck. I heard two soldiers talking about him. But why did they leave him on the deck? Because he was dead. Dead? They must have thought he was dead, and maybe they were right. But I can feel a slight warmth around his heart. Or maybe hope for him. A faint hope that we get him breathe. Now, I want you to keep his body warm. Bring out those cloths in the hot water and place them around his body. And keep changing them to keep them hot. Susan, I want you to massage his legs. Get the blood flowing more easily. Tom, we will need those bellows and wipe them off for me. Then, your mother farm ahead this morning, your surgeon's assistant. All right? Well, anything you to say, Miss Trangeman, but I can only use one hand. That will be enough. And Tom, still those bellows for there. Now, place the nozzle over the end of this tube. <laughs> now, you're going to press the air from those fellows very gently into that tube. As the air goes into his nose, then I want you to press his windpipe downward slowly. Now, a little man, can you feel it? Aye, that's the windpipe, I reckon. You'll get the idea of it when we start. Now, Tom. Steady. See his chest expanding as air goes into his lungs? My best leg rubbing acting. <laughs> Early ER, I think you would say. Early ER, yeah. definitely, yeah. So it's now 67 and it looks, oh, it's so rude now, it looks so much older, doesn't it? Than the yes, it does, yeah. Was that a bit, that was a piece called uh, Cast It Away in a series called Merry Go Around. Was that your first ever? That was my very, very, very first ever TV um, for Dorothy Brooking as the director. Um, and Yes, I, I, it was during the summer holidays, suddenly the school rang up and said, go up to the BBC and, and meet this, this person, which I did, and um, started filming a couple of weeks. She had cast somebody else, and they got ill or something happened, so she cast me, which was really nice, and the beginning of quite a long relationship with her. I was really excited to learn that uh, Julia had worked with Dorothy Booking because Dorothy Booking means to me Tom's Midnight Garden and the Secret Garden and things, and actually Julia has her archive. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do, which um, I would talk to Chris about maybe you guys making better use of than it's sitting in my, in my loft. But she's got an amazing collection. She kept everything. And she did storyboards of all her shots for all her shows. And I've got Kizzy was another one of hers that it's very, very popular. But she was this amazing a woman in DC drama, yeah. and you got her as your first producer, mm -hmm. director, so that you were straight in doing uh, important work with somebody who was incredibly different, and she stayed with you. Yeah, cool. she did. I think she, I worked with, I worked with a couple of people more than once, but Doro I worked with three times, and she was tough, really tough, but she was very good. She was trained herself in the theatre, um, Lillian Bayliss at the Old Vic, she was in the Old Vic school. So she brought something of that kind of theatrical theatre discipline to the work. And also, you know, there weren't that many women working in television at that time. So I think she was, she was tough on lots of levels. So when you say you, that was in the school on summer holidays, was that drama school or were you, was that early you were No, I, I had gone to uh, a ballet school, it was arts educational. Which, and I was in London, um, and the idea was that I was being trained to be a dancer, because that's what I thought I wanted to do. Um, when I got there, I discovered that having been really rather good in my little dancing school in Burnham, Buckinghamshire, I wasn't very good when I got into London, and there were these really very clever girls of my age. Um, so that was worrying. And then from there, I did the Children's Corps de Ballet Festival Hall, Oh, we did Nutcracker and Sleeping Beauty. And I watched these ballet dancers with their toes bleeding as they took off their shoes. And I just thought, it's got to be something better than this, easier than this. So that, uh, I was very pleased when, when Casters Away happened because then after that, I did Railway Children. And then when it came to the Corps de Ballet again, I was told I couldn't go back into the Corps de Ballet. I was too big already. <laughs> I was very pleased, actually. So, so when Cass and I came up, you weren't actively pursuing television, so how did they find no. you? 
Well, I, the school then had an agent, and I've been back and talked to the school. They don't have an agent now. Um, but the school did have an agent at that time, so people went... I mean, you notice the accents there of Louis, the, Louis Selwyn was the boy who played my brother. And they were very keen to find middle-class southern accent kids for television. Um, RP, really, received pronunciation, I guess. So they went to Arts Ed to find that, and they found me there. So it's not what you know, it's how you speak. Uh, do you know, I really think it was the fact that I had that accent. It was the fact that I was 12 but looked younger, because you had to be over 12 to be able to work at that point, and then you had to also be at a theatre school, I think. And that all changed within a year or so, but by that time I'd done some work, so I was established. So as soon as you got classes away, you needed what you wanted, and now you started pursuing rock. No, I didn't really do that either. Doro had directed the 1950 version of The Railway Children. She knew Julia Smith, who was directing the 1967 version? 68. 68 version, with Jenny Agata, the television. And she suggested me to Julia Smith, and then Julia Smith saw Casters Away, and then I got that job. And then the woman who played my mother in The Railway Children, her husband was a director, Alan Bridges, and he cast me in a Wednesday play. So those first three jobs were all together. They all kind of formed boom, boom. Well, actually, we mentioned Railway Children. Let's have a look at it. Mark, come that clip. and that's reminded me of moments in the railway children. Um, and Jenny and I were good friends, and she was a real prankster. So I remember lots of off-camera off stuff with her. She locked me in the loo, that sort of thing. Um, well, you could practice more dance I could practice more dance for my future employment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but what about Julia Smith? She directed this. And, and yes. I know Julia Smith best for... I mean, uh, EastEnders and all sorts of things, such as Angels and things. Was she, uh, like Dara at the time, a big light in the BBC, or was it a big deal getting around the children of Um, I, I don't remember her at all when we're f with the filming of, of Railway Children. I really can hardly picture her, whereas I can always see Dora. She's always there, she's got her viewfinder, I can see how she's mapping it out, but I can't see Julia. I can't remember in, her in rehearsal. More, I remember Gordon Gostolo, who played Perks. Um, other actors, more than her. So whether this was part of her style, I later worked with her on Angels, um, rather disastrously, actually. Which again, so we're going to And when she did EastEnders, I went up for EastEnders. No, she wouldn't even see me for EastEnders, because she said, you're too posh. 
And I said, yes, but I'm an actress. So she said, no, I don't want that. I want the real thing. So, I, but yeah, but I mean, I think, I think she was an extraordinarily powerful force, but she, it, not with the performers. I think it was much more in terms of what she got through at the BBC, what she got them to allow her to make and to pursue. And I mean, obviously, famously, the um, Spanish... Alvarado. Alvarado. Yes. Um, but, you know, bloody hell, she did it. With, uh, the railroad has been kind of sorry, overshadowed by the film. Yes. Like, but, <laughs> 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 At the time, I know it was very successful and very popular, and friends in New York talking to you were very excited because they remembered yeah. the railway of children. Um, was it another thing that seemed a big deal to you, or was it another thing that was a surprising success? What, the... Did this version of the railway of did you come in thinking prestigious production or just... No, no, I, I didn't have a clue about anything, it was just great fun. Um, and I liked putting all the clothes on, and I liked... I didn't like having my hair put in rags every night, which they did in makeup, and because I talked too much, the makeup guy used to put a sponge in my mouth, <laughs> try and get me to sit still. But it was all very exciting. Um, actually, I mean, with the film, what was interesting was they shot the film at Elstree while I was doing Double Deckers. And Jenny and Sally and Gary came over to the set of Double Deckers because it was all very intense and rather dour on, on Lionel Jeffrey's set. So they came over to our set for a bit of fun. So that was kind of pleasing. But um, Lionel Jeffries did tell me, I was yeah, 14 when I did Double Deckers, Lionel Jeffries did say to me, I didn't cast you as Phyllis for two reasons. One, I needed somebody who was out of licence. I was nearly out of licence, but not quite. So and, that that's oh, sorry, um, the Children's Licensing Act, which had changed from when I did Railway Children first, and you had to be 12 or whatever, it then all children could work a certain amount of hours and a certain amount of days, etc. And I was nearly out of licence, but not quite. And he needed to shoot railway children very, very fast. So he said, the first reason is that you're not out of licence. Sally Thompson was about 22 or 23 when she, made, when she played Phyllis. But he said, the second reason I didn't cast you is I don't think you're good enough. <laughs> and I like, OK, fine. And that was, you know, 14. That's kind of, OK. Right. Right, OK. So... I went into the loo and got another dance move. <laughs> <laughs> it does seem like uh, you went for, you, you rejected ballet and, and the blood and the feet to go through a life of constant rejection. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, fair <laughs> no, you just, you get, it's part of it. I mean, my mum and dad were both in theatre. Dad was in the BBC by then, but he'd been a director and a stage director. He, my mother had been an agent. Her mother had been an actress. So you kind of knew that was the territory you were going into. And I think you develop not a tough skin, because I got really upset when I didn't get jobs sometimes. Or worse, when I remember Joan Croft. Joan Croft. Joan Croft, director. She was doing a show, and she had booked me for an interview. And my agent said, oh, that's very good, she's on telly tonight, and then you'll, you can see her in the morning. And she rang up in the morning and said, tell her not to bother. I was, you know, really devastated at 15, 16 to have that. So it wasn't that I developed a tough skin, but I did develop a thing of saying, okay, I'm not right for it. Um, it's not what the marketplace is buying this week. And I think that enabled me to get through it without going into awful rejection. Prices. So you were forced to be quite mature quite quickly. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. How did that play with your parents then, um, having wanted you to go at low levels? Did they come round to all this by then? I think I had mum on side, because she used to chaperone me, and she really enjoyed it. She loved chaperone. She'd also been a film editor herself during the war. And so I remember on Railway Children, they threw the film in the bin, um, some bits of film in the bin at the hotel. My mum went, you can't do that, it's really inflammable, the whole place is going to go up. And they said, no, no, it's all right, it's the you know, film. But she was, so she used all that sort of knowledge. But she loved it and enjoyed it, so she was on side. But in fact, she wasn't allowed to chaperone me for Double Deckers um, because they had a chaperone employed by the company, which is really quite dodgy, actually. 
But what she did was that she said, okay, she can do it, but we want, I want open access to the set, so I want to be able to come in any time without pre-warning. And that worked fine. And I, was, I wanted to be on my own. I was thinking it was fine, but when you always come somewhere aware that she could. No, but that was all right. I used to tell her when I was doing the dance numbers, because I liked her to see the dance numbers, because she liked them and I liked her seeing them. So that was fine. But otherwise, I had, um, we had some porter cabins, and the chaperone was really busy looking after the little ones. Michael, yeah, he was in that. Um, uh, Peter and, and Bryn were out of licence, and I was sort of hovering in between. So I sort of managed to just escape the... The chaperone, um, and that's kind of when I really developed my strong 20 a day habit behind the scene doc, I think. <laughs> I was just thinking, we, I think we all assumed when you know you, your mother couldn't be there to see it, you could have been up to anything. You didn't have time, no. I would have thought. For no, no, no. How did no. you even have time for 20 a day? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't swear that hard um, at that point. Um, no, there really wasn't time. I used to, the car came to pick me up at 6 30. I used to get to the studios, get ready, go on, either shoot that day, or I go straight into rehearsal or into recording one of the songs. But there, re and there was also a school room, and I was meant to be doing some O level preparation, but I mean, it was hopeless. I didn't do anything. Did you get your O levels? Yeah. Okay. That's I got English language one year, English literature the next year, and French the next year. But, uh, so by the double decker then, you've done the trio of the cast of the way with Doro, you've done a Wednesday play, yeah. you've um, done the railway children, so you, you were big and they were still trying to claim that you were picked up off the streets. I seem so rude when I say it. Yeah, 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 but absolutely. Disco yes, yeah. Okay. So by then, you were a, a professional. Yeah. And, things. and I actually clicked from one of your... No, unfortunately, we don't click from this, but it's been destroyed, unfortunately. Which Sherlock Holmes. Oh. You must tell us about this. This was from uh, 1968. Uh, I forgot that date. was that before? That's actually around about the same time as Double Deckers then, but Sherlock Holmes with Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing. Oh, he was just so lovely. Um, I can't remember what I did in it, but I remember I had a scene in which he asked me some questions. And I came into the rehearsal room, and he was taking a really long time over a scene before and he wasn't like he didn't like the way it's been written and he was suggesting some changes in a very very gentlemanly way and um so i was hanging around for about an hour and a half and he apologized profusely for this i thought it was very nice of him and we did the scene um the next day he came in with a box of chocolates to say thank you for my patience and i just thought what a lovely man and then when we were shooting double deckers he was doing a, ha a hammer horror um it can't have been a hammer horror. It was a horror film at, that was being shot at Elstree. And he was up in the restaurant, and I thought, shall I go and say hello, will he remember me? And he was just so sweet. And he got up and he greeted me and he sat me down. And it was just, it, he was just an extraordinarily lovely man. Real, a real sort of, I don't know, one of a kind, in a way. It's like the eerie, actually, when you did that, I could see him. He was not so. No, 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 no. <laughs> And one of your next, you talked to me about wanting to see this. We have a well, clip from a thing called the mating machine, please. Oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> uh, that is 
really, I haven't seen you. God, I can't move. I remember doing that. Um, what was great fun about that particular piece, when I saw it on the list that Simon had got together, and I suddenly remembered it was, it was about being a child actress. And it was about how you behaved as a child actress. And there's one scene in there where I think I come down to breakfast with dark glasses on. And they say, you know, oh, well, hello, darling, do you want cornflakes or whatever? And I say, no coffee, just black coffee. And it got a laugh in the studio. And I thought, oh, wow. And that was my first experience, if you like, of live performance, what it's like to get a laugh. But also to kind of, in a weird way, be performing myself. I was a child actress, and I was performing being a child actress. And that was the first time I'd done that. And I found it quite... But I'm really thrilled to see it was with Julian and Bailey. <laughs> I think that's the only time I ever got a title credit. As you say, we're running slightly behind, there's Sorry. a lot of things I want to get through, particularly what you're doing now. Right. So we just snip ahead to... I mean, this is uh, one I remember. No, this is, I think, I see this as your first big children's success because I didn't see the railway children. This is the one I remember, The Witch's Daughter right. from 71 Mark. Can we have a call? so that I could just watch her for a day to try and work out how you begin to feel what it's like to, to be blind. Um, I also remember we had to go down a huge cliff to get to that beach and to get to a cave that we filmed in. And anybody who's done any health and safety, the idea of taking three kids down this ladder that was sort of suspended off the side of a cliff and the camera and the, oh, it was mad. You'd never get away with it. But we were on the Isle of Mull um, in Scotland where that was shot and at the same time Betty Davis and Robert Wagner were filming on the other side of the island a wonderful B-movie called Mad and Sin and uh, they used to kind of come and buzz our they thought our food wagon was better than theirs which was quite amusing <laughs> Did you have a story about hair to do with Betty Davis? Oh <laughs> yes! Betty, there was one day where Robert Wagner came over and hung out on our set which was very strange um, because Betty Davis had been on a cliff top doing a scene with her and the wind had blown and her wig had gone into the sea. She absolutely refused to go on. So she went and hid in her hotel and a, a, a new wig. Somebody did rescue her and went, hey, I'm no. So they had to go back to the States and get new ones. So she just didn't work. Brilliant. I went into the hotel where she was and I didn't see her. All I saw was these cigarettes. <laughs> with that, with the red lipstick around them. Like, oh, Actually, in that scene, just off camera, your mother character is sunbathing, and it looks so cold and impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was, it was very good for Mull, apparently. It was quite warm. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm. but I think water starts to come into your career, because... Um, <laughs> We actually have a clip next uh, from, actually, the reason I know you at all, Blake Seven. Uh -huh. uh, Mark, can we have a clip, please? It's not 
natural water. The stuff we get's been recycled a thousand times, and it's dose for suppressants. I'll check it here. Watch my stuff. Okay. Proves the fate, but nothing else. Doesn't it bother you that you spend your life in a state of drug-induced tranquility? You got a pair of us, that? Yeah. Why should the administration try to drug us? To keep control. They've been stepping up the suppressants because the number of dissidents is growing. They've seen what's happening and they want to stop it. Stop what? Don't you know? Can't you remember anything about the treatments they gave you? I've had no treatments. I thought there'd be something left. Some trace of memory. What about my memory? There's the signal. So that would have been 1978. Mm. Up to then, you'd started, you'd had kind of a very big project every year. Yeah. Then you were becoming an adult actor and things were starting to change, like you, you're shot a few minutes later. Yeah, I get shot and that's it. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean it's interesting that you say actor, the point is I wasn't, I was an actress. How interesting, I always say actor for both. I know, I kind of um, really bang the drum for being an actress because there is a difference and the difficulty is as a woman continuing to work right the way through your life, it's very very hard. I reckon most women have a 10 to 15 year window somewhere, if they work, and if, as I thought of myself as a jobbing actress. I was never a lead, I was always supporting, but I felt that I kind of kept going and very, if I was out of work for more than three months I got really quite worried. But roundabout, not for, I did pull, has pulled up being before this, wasn't it? Was yeah, yes six, it was. Yeah. But round about here, I was 23-ish, and I'd had, I had a, a, my daughter in, in 1978, and the work did start to just begin to tailor it. There's that thing where I was meeting directors who were saying, so tell me what you've done, and they didn't know anything about what I'd done, so it was kind of difficult. Um, yeah. But you did get to work again with Julia Smith around that time. Angels were being just around. Yes, yeah. yeah. Julia heard that I had uh, had a child, so she rang me up and said, look, I've got this episode in Angels. It's about a woman who has a baby, and she's always bringing it into hospital because she thinks the baby's ill, and of course it's not. It's, you know, kind of Munchausen type thing. So I said, okay, but I don't want to put my daughter under any undue stress. No, 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 to them, absolutely fine. We will have recorded, pre-recorded, all the crime, no problem, you'll be there. So I said, okay, and then I said, you know, my husband at the time, her dad, must be there as well. Yes, 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 it'll all be fine. So we get into the studio, we've done the run, and the sound recording is all going of the crime, and we did get into the studio, and the nurse, the other actress, took Becky away and put her in the cot. And then somebody just held me back while she cried and they filmed her. And Richard um, was delighted because he, he said it was one of his finest moments. He stepped in front of Pebble Mill and went, no, you will film her no more! And whisked her out <laughs> of the cot and that was that. And Julia did a big thing in the Radio Times saying the child was never upset. She was, you know, with her mother. We made every, sure everything was okay. She lied. <laughs> I know, I know. We haven't got a clip of that though, have we? No, because my daughter has just had a baby and I was telling her that there might be a clip and she went, oh, I can't see that. So. But we might just have a clip of someone else in that story. Oh. Well, can we have the next one, please? From Together. <laughs> oh, dear. Pay attention to the man. Anything special you'd like tonight? Because I can always pop along when Harry Klein's doling out from the freezer. Richard? Uh, not tonight. Why not? Well, um... You're not working late again. I'm trying to get some sunglasses up at the office. It's the third time this week. I can't help it. I hate it. We hardly see each other these days. Don't you mean? Well, there's nothing to look forward to all day. You don't think I like it, do you? Beginning to think you're going off me. No. Well, husbands are supposed to sometimes when they've got pregnant wives. I have work to do, that's all. 
Yes. I'll see you later. I think we can all guess now who the man was. Yes, um, I'm Richard Everett. And he and I have played brother and sister three times, including on stage. You never can tell. Um, and then we played husband and wife another three times, I think. In fact, he used the same suit as <coughs> in Together for County Hall when he played my husband in that. I thought you were going to say when you got married. No. <laughs> no, no, he had a rather wonderful velvet suit when we got married. Um, but, yeah, he, he, in County Hall, in this story, we had a baby, therefore we had to leave. Did, did anybody ever see Together? I've heard of it. Had you? No, it, no. It was really weird. It was a daytime <laughs> southern television programme set in and around Bracknell where there was this experiment to have housing which mixed all ages together. And it was the most extraordinary mixture of actresses and some really, really well-known actors and actresses in it. Um, and also Sarah Green was in it as well, who then later went on and did repeat her. I mean, that was written by Barbara Clare, who's <coughs> yeah. probably better known for, for Enlightenment and Doctor Who. But there's also, I think, Phil Redmond. Phil Redmond. On that. And he's one who did what you call he, your biggest, last, your last big. My last big television series, which was County Hall. Mm -hmm. And again, and that's one where Richard played my husband, and that time we couldn't get pregnant. It was all very confusing. Um, <laughs> but in the storyline. But the. He created County Hall, and he was really interested in Brookside. That's what he was moving toward. So he got County Hall to <coughs> The scripts were pretty scrappy. Um, it wasn't good. They were not good characters. It hadn't been well drawn. And people want, you know, actors tend to, in the days when you used to rehearse in that way, they'll tend to kind of go, well, what if and this happened and that happened? Um, but it, 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 the concept wasn't right. And again, it was about local government. And I think the reviews just said, this is about the most boring thing out. Um, and so he just kind of abandoned it and pushed for Brookside, and who can blame him? Yeah, well, um, I know, you know, <laughs> absolutely. But yes, County Hall was my, that was my last big series for the BBC. All right, if you're in it. But you did do uh, one more, at least one more. We have a nice clip from Lovejoy. Oh, oh, the frightness. because there was a strike on at London Weekend Television, hence it was black and white. Um, actually, it was an amazing piece. It was about a father and a daughter. The father's been estranged from the daughter and arranges to meet her. Uh, it's called Have a Nice Time at the Zoo, darling. And the mother drops them off. And the whole kind of 30 minutes is just this father and daughter walking around each other. And the daughter is incredibly cruel to him. Um, and eventually he hangs himself. Who played the father? And the father was played by Geoffrey Bailden, who was a lovely actor, who I'd worked with on the Wednesday play a few years earlier. And in that, I was writing in that too. So he wrote, he was sort of wrote little things of, from the fairy king and put them in the tree, and I just got it was him and exposed him as being a silly man. But it was, it, he was a lovely, lovely actor, and it was very interesting. That, I think, the frightness was the first thing I did. What year was it? Uh, 73. Yeah, it was the first thing I did. So I was still playing younger than I was. Um, I must have been 18 in 73. And I was playing younger than that. But it, for me, it was where I began to kind of develop what I thought was my adult acting style. So it's quite weird that it was shot in black and white like that. Well, it's it's really like your annoying. earliest pieces. Mm. It feels like actually kind of pants around your career and more, but we start to talk about the end. 
And the reason I want to ask about Lovejoy is you said there you were on the set with all this experience, all of these things behind you. But it was more of this thing of directors and people not knowing what you'd done before. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's different times, isn't it? I did an episode of Lovejoy and I did an episode of The Bill. And all within a kind of couple of months. A, I got fantastically nervous, which was ridiculous, because I was doing a spit and a cough, really a spit and a cough. Um, but when I was doing Lovejoy, I, we were out there doing a, doing a scene, we were setting up. And the cameraman said to the director, where do you want this? Is it two shots, is it over shot, whatever, whatever. And the director responded, and I'd listened, and so worked out, yeah, okay, that's what we're doing. And then the cameraman looked at me and he went, uh, sweetheart, can you look here, please? And I just thought, oh, God, I can't do this anymore. I don't know why, that particular... He didn't know what work I'd done, why should he? But for me, it was suddenly, I can't... I don't think I can just be sweetheart at the other end of the... And with the bill, um, I'd never worked that fast on that kind of multi-unit job before. And I was playing a head teacher in a school. And we were filming in a school. And I went in and I did what I had to do, rehearsal. And they went, no, no, we've shot it. It's done. So I thought, All right, okay. So I thought time had come to move on. I think the quality of the bill reflects that. It's not a discussion. But you moved on. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I wonder if time for questions here, so I'm going to race through the last bit, but I'm actually so interested in the last bit, because you went uh, completely away from acting, mm. you went into academia, and you got into academia partly on the money from the double debtors. Yeah. Um, the bridge was that I had worked for a script reading. We, we had... The South West Branch of Equity had got together with new writers at the Riverside Studios, and we basically said, let's kind of try and encourage new writing. And I've been doing that for a year, and I loved it. I really loved working with new writers. I really loved reading the scripts and moving forward with stuff. So I thought, what I need to do is I need to be a script editor, or I need to be a literary manager. I need a degree. Remember, I've only got my three O levels. It's a bit tricky. Um, I think I need to do an English literature degree so that I know the great classics that I can refer to when people using them. So I ran on Kingston University on a complete whim and I said, it was May, and I said I'd quite like to come to university and they said have you got an access course? And I said no. And they said have you got A-levels? I said no. I said but I've been doing the script reading and I can show you some of my reports and I said and I, I used, she said well what were you doing? I said oh well I used to be an actress. And so she said, okay, what do you do? Double decker, she said, I love double decker. <laughs> okay, so I got an interview, and that was brilliant. And then double deckers did get repeated, and Equity did make um, David Gerber Productions pay us for a showing, which funded my first year at university very, very nicely. So, yeah, and then from there, I did English literature, and then I thought, this is stupid, I need to be doing theatre. So I went to Royal Holloway and did my PhD. And then I got a job as a lecturer at Royal Holloway. And now I'm just about to embark, I'm just about to leave Royal Holloway, go to Central School of Speech and Drama, so completely full circle, as visiting professor there. I interviewed Julie, Julie first because she did these 15 minutes in Blake Sender and writing a book about it. But I was also aware that you had some uh, academic interest in theatre. But even as we were speaking, you were made a professor. Yes. Oh, yes. I feel responsible. Oh, oh, William! So. It was William, of course. <laughs> yes, quite right. I am a professor in um, the yes in women's theatre history. So it's all thanks to you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but in this new position, so you've been looking back. This is what you mentioned earlier, a chapter about your own work, reviewing it. So I'm really interested to see what, what are you doing with that material. Okay, there, um, I've written a book about a woman who did probably the first one woman show in 1830. She did a two hour, well it was two and a half to three to begin with, stand up effectively. And I thought this was really interesting and in it, it's called Dramatic Recollections and she's remembering her own life as an actress of Drury Lane stage at the very beginning of the 19th century. So I took some of her work and I took some of the Double Decker stuff and I did a sort of, instead of just doing a lecture, I did a performance piece where I inter cut the two really, some of her material and some of my material, and thought about what being a child actress was like for me in the 60s and 70s. And did you find that 
finally do the toilet dance move. No, I did. I did. Actually, I danced with myself. I projected a uh, dance I did with Robbie the Robot, and then I danced it now. And that was really interesting to do, because A, I remembered the moves. Um, but I kept saying, because obviously I was dancing in front of it so I couldn't see, and I kept talking about, well, did she do that? And did she do this? And I realised that there was that sort of separation. But I want to go on now and do some more practical work, which is kind of why I'm going back to Central, um, with young actors coming up, talking about how we deal with the ageing, how you deal with the older woman, how we deal with not being um, 15 or 17 or 19 forever, and how you think about that, how we think about that on what we see on TV. I think it's getting better, but it's still got a long way to go. And I'm extraordinarily fortunate, and I think, thanks to Kaleidoscope, there is going to be material that I've got that I can actually say, I can track some of that work through, and that is just fabulous. We have just a few moments left, but I'd like to ask, does anybody have any questions for Julie? No, they all want to go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris said that there's normally something somebody wants to ask. There, there you go, there you go. You see? I've got the magic touch, William. You see? Oh, thank <laughs> you. Can I just Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering whether, uh, looking back over your career, you thought you'd made a good choice or perhaps was there another avenue of work that sometimes you just think to yourself, I wonder if I'd gone down that avenue, what might have happened? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's always the case, isn't it? I have many parallel lives that I'd like to have led in some respects. But the life I had, do you mean in terms of being within the theatre or within, or just another completely different profession? No, I mean within, within, within the profession. Ah, oh, well, within the profession, there were a couple I have never regretted a job I said yes to. Actually, possibly Follyfoot, because I hated riding those bloody horses. <laughs> so, and riding a horse in hot pants and getting your bum bit is no joke. With the boom swinging. The horse. Not the dog, the horse. I think I regretted some theatre jobs that I didn't take, that I was offered on, uh, after Double Deckers, I was offered some good stage work, and I didn't take it, and I do regret that. I didn't take it because I didn't have the nerve, I think. I didn't have the training either. Any more? Any more things people would like to add? Question? Well, can I ask one thing? If, um, if tomorrow you got a phone call and someone offered you uh, a dream part, would you be interested in going forward and taking that now? Ooh. Or is it all behind you? Well, actually, because I've just agreed to go to Central, I've reactivated my equity card. Because A, I think it's really important that young actors do realise how important equity has been in the establishment of the profession and, and the protection we have. But do you know what? I think there was a little bit of me saying, well, if they offered me something, I would quite like to do a little. You know, I think probably I'd love to do something really tiny. I'd love to be, yeah, I'd love to do that. I think it'd be fun. I think if they offered me a big part, I'd absolutely be terrified. But a small little vignette somewhere. Mm. Well, I hear rumours they've been making Blake seven so you never know. Oh, <laughs> you know, I could go, you know, I found that location too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so I've also, also heard, I mean, there might be a kind of here come the single decker bus with disabled access. <laughs> 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 there's, there's, all sorts, there's all sorts of remakes going on.